neonatal germinal matrix interventricular hemorrhage is one of the most common conditions that I treat. There's about 14,000 new cases each year in the United States, and 40% of those infants will have high-grade IVH that's bleeding into the ventricles and then also into the uh, periventricular hemorrhagic infarction adjacent to the ventricles. And these kids have, have poor outcomes. Of preterm infants with brain injury, they have the worst outcomes out of all kids with preterm brain injury. And 25% of patients will go on to develop hydrocephalus. And that's where initially, you know, I, I came in as from a neurosurgical standpoint, trying to understand why fluid accumulates. Um, and there's a bunch of NICU admissions each year, about 1700 NICU admissions. So this is a brief example of progressive increase in ventricle size after hemorrhage. And what I'd like to highlight is that while we observe with ultrasounds, there's really no treatments during this time to prevent the development of hydrocephalus. Um, the germinal matrix is the site for, it's a stem cell rich population, the site of new neurons during development. This is an example of the germinal matrix. I don't know if you can see my arrow here. Um, it involutes over time. It is thought to, um, uh, it's, it's a highly vascular, uh, region. Um, the exact reasons why there's a propensity for bleeding in this area, I think that's another question, but it's thought to be due to vessel fragility in this area as it's involuting. And so you see this 26 week mark um, and 29 week mark, it's still present, but involuting and it's um, susceptible to bleeding. And so the bleeding occurs not only um, in the ventricles, but really in the germinal matrix. And, and so um, there's a um, uh, effect on development, not only hydrocephalus. Um, so in terms of when I started, I joined a lab that was expert in, in iron. So mechanisms of iron induced injury. And so I developed an animal model of post hemorrhagic hydrocephalus by looking at a number of different blood components and a bit coincidentally found that hemoglobin and iron were most capable of producing hydrocephalus when injected into the ventricle. And the, and the reason I, I focused on sort of the blood components and iron was that we had an iron ex, expert there and, and given the environment that I was in, um, I sort of tackled that mecha, mechanism uh, as one of the first ones just due to the, the environment at the time. Um, and it turned out, this is just an example of um, the components of blood, um, you have lysis of red blood cells that occurs after hemorrhage, releasing heme, and then ultimately iron, ferrous iron um, can react with hydrogen peroxide to result in free radicals, which is also thought to contribute to injury. Um, how does this relate to CSF flow? We don't really know. Uh, this is an example of the ependema of a six-month-old that had grade four IVH and was transferred in for an ETV CPC, and I'll get to the CPC part in a second because I have uh, some thoughts on that based on um, some of the findings we've had in the lab. Um, but you can see here, these are all pictures of the appendema showing, um, showing iron, uh, sorry, sorry, hemocytorin, um, blood clot, disruption of the appendema. And then on the right is an example of sort of already atrophied choroid plexus, but then um, uh, coagulation of the choroid plexus that um, will be occurring soon in that video. Um, let me see here. I see we have 10 minutes left. So let me see, let me just jump ahead in the interest of time so that we have time for discussion because I know we end at 10. Um, I will, let's see, highlight a few things here. So just two slides. Um, Initially, we took a sort of broad approach to understanding the interaction of blood components and the ventricular surface, the appendema, which lines the ventricles, and the choroid plexus. Um, and these are different examples of investigations of the, of the cilia. So it turns out that the cilia that line the ventricles is a very heterogeneous population. And so there's not necessarily specific widespread destruction or injury. It's just not that simple. Um, and the role of cilia in the ventricles, I still think is not well understood in whether or not cilia themselves are capable of propagating CSF flow. 
So um, we're answering questions twofold. Are cilia necessary for propagation of bulk CSF flow, which probably not, but that, that question is being answered currently. And then also, what is the role of specific cilia networks, cilia cell populations within the ventricles to potentially deliver um, important factors related to brain development? Um, this is a, a video of cilia uh, movement there. This is an on-face view here of the ependymal wall showing the cilia populations. It's a basal body marker and then a cell, um, uh, cell membrane marker there. Um, skipping ahead, um, this is an example of flow network in the ventricle. So this is a map of the lateral ventricle, uh, lateral wall explant. And what I want to show you here is there's specific sort of networks of flow. Um, and then it's not all flow just from one side of the ventricle to the other. We see specific networks of flow within the ventricles. And this has been shown in, um, in the third ventricle um, in slice cultures. Um, so it's likely that not only the third ventricle has these specific networks of flow, but also the lateral ventricles. Um, and then finally, um, the, hold on. So just as a last parting comment, um, because we were unable to do high resolution uh, animal MRIs, we are now, we have a new MRI scanner with coils for our, for our um, mice and rats. Um, but because of that challenge, I made a decision a few years ago to, to, to find another way and use the advantages that we have here at the institution to try to examine uh, and map CSF flow uh, because the gadolinium enhanced MRI was, was not gonna be feasible at that time. Um, so we ended up using um, gold nanoparticle enhanced X-ray nanotomography and it, it's a, essentially a fancy micro CT. It turns out that the resolution is a, it's a thousand times higher resolution than even the small animal MRI. And with this method, um, this is a, we use different size gold nanoparticles. And in the, this area here, we were able to recapitulate prior investigations related to the glymphatic theory, which many of you may know, um, which deals with paravascular, para-arterial flow of spinal fluid, which moves through the brain and then out through uh, the paravascular spaces of the venous system. Um, we were able to show patterns of flow there, but we were also able to identify um, a, a number of other pathways, which are with a much higher resolution. Um, uh, and this is an example of some of the histologic images that we're able to map 2D, 3D uh, uh, flow patterns, and then also use histologic sections to look at um, uh, tracing, uh, tracing CSF into specific cell populations and regions of the brain. So um, we're almost, uh, complete with that uh, that report, and so I'm hopeful to share share with everyone um, shortly what we found. Um, so I think the main key is that I didn't get to show you through all the slides that um, being flexible, taking advantage of what's available to you at your institution, um, and you may set off on a specific path to answer a specific question. Um, but in the end, you may, you may sort of change paths and um, broaden your scope of investigation. And I think being flexible and um, with, with what you're investigating, I think is also, also key in that area as well. So um, this is just acknowledgements to the uh, large lab and um, uh, clinical team and then funding sources as well. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm.